On the northwest coast of the island of Oahu, there is a valley called Makua. Early Hawaiians farmed the land, fished the ocean, as was done. On the northwest coast of the island of Oahu, there is a valley called Makua. Early Hawaiians farmed the land, fished the ocean, as was done throughout the Hawaiian Islands. Food was plentiful, and everyone lived in harmony with nature. The Hawaiians were happy with their gods. Life was good to them. In 1778, Captain Cook brought syphilis and ideas of profit to Hawaii. This was the beginning of the end to this good life. The missionaries, in the name of their God, began to take control of Hawaii's lands. In 1893, their descendants, with the help of armed United States Marines, took over all of Hawaii against the will of the Hawaiian people. Five years later, the Hawaiian Islands were illegally annexed by the United States Congress. Today, the United States military and the Hawaii state government lay claim to Makua Valley. Hawaiians are fighting back to regain their stolen lands, and Makua is part of this fight. Well, we coming back home, home to Makua, notwithstanding what the state says that, you know, it's not our home, we are residents of Maku and we just came back home. What we are saying is that it should be consistent with its history, with its lifestyle. The history of Maku is that, uh, of the Makai side of Maku is that it is, it has always been a fishing village. In fact, as, as some of the signs to verify this, just before we started our march back to Maku, we found a Ulumaika stone. And these, I think, is Hoai Lona. It's signs of, of what Maku wants us to do to begin that reconstruction of Makua. And the way I look at it too is that it is to begin the reconstruction of the nation of Hawaii. I don't feel what is right, what, what the state is trying to do. Uh, I don't see why they gotta make this one talk. They get enough of it. So I, I say, just let everybody live the way they were living. They were happy way before this thing happens. They all can be happy again, just letting them come back. And uh, for the old folk, they enjoy living this way. They stay in apartments or staying in houses, crowded up, but down here it's more free. There's nothing to worry about. I grew up on these beaches from seven years old until I was 17. My Uncle Sam and my Uncle Bell used to take care of us every summer. It was my mother's kuuhonua. <laughs> but um, I think the homecoming is a good thing. Like when my uncle, when I met him at the first rally, he said, uh, Would you, did you ever think that they come and do this to us? And I said, yes. It was only a matter of time. Then, of course, like my uncle is, uh, he's not a radical. He's been self-sufficient for over 25 years, you know. Never went under welfare or nothing. So how come they do this to somebody, people like that, you know? This really makes me piss off. A mass of us, a mass of Hawaiians should get involved. Even if, if, even if they don't know what's going on, but get involved, learn, and uh, come out and look what's happening. And listen, 
Don't just come out and then walk away and make your own, you know, judgment and say, oh, gee, this guy's been living down here for free. Gee, this and that. But, you know, like I heard some of the sisters and brothers, they're not on the welfare. They come down here, they work, they sell the fish, or they trade different things to survive. Because the cost of living today is too high. For your rent, for your food, for your medical, everything is too high. So I guess they come out here. And out, out here, I guess, it seems like the medicine is right here. Everything here. Right there, the salt water itself can cure most of your sickness. You see, the history of Hawaii is that Makua was, or this area that we're at now, is government land. And it's a, it's a land of the government of the nation of Hawaii. And as citizens of that nation, you know, we have every right to be here. That's a tradition, that's a culture, that's a law of Hawaii. However, the problem right now is that the, this government, the state government, claims that they own the land, and we are saying simply that they do not own the land. The land belongs to the nation of Hawaii. We as citizens of that nation have a right to use that land, and we are willing to contest, we are willing to challenge the state's claim to ownership in any impartial tribunal that they want to go to. The problem is that the state will not recognize our challenge. They do not want to take this matter before an impartial tribunal, and their only reply to us is to bring their bulldozers in, bring their dogs in, bring their guns in, and force the people out by the use of force which is uh, simply a reversion to the old concept that might makes right. And uh, we are simply not going to be intimidated by that kind of action. And uh, we are going to insist on our rights as citizens of the nation. And we will continue to live here. Just to notice, to tell you what, what's happening. So you'll be well aware of it. Hello, Mr. Mahiai. Yeah, thank How you. How are you today? Well, here, Same you. old thing again, huh? Here's one for you. Uh -huh. It outlines everything that we're here for today. Uh -huh. We're passing them out, and that's all we're going to do. Just handing you the notices. Uh, do you think the state has a right to take the people off this land? Would you ask Mr. Ono that at the bottom there? Is he a boss? Yes, he is. Who are you, sir? Can you give us your name? Yeah, I'll give you my business card. Thank you. The state's position is that we should not be doing what we're doing here today. We should not be putting up any structure in w which would be habitable. That's what they did the last time, they dish off papers like this. Mm -hmm. Paper no good. <laughs> no more steel. A lot of waste of paper. <laughs> and if we should do that, they will fine each one of us $500 per day. Per occurrence. That, that's basically their position. It's in Perio. So this is a front yard. Let's make day number four. Mm -hmm. And all's well. All's well. <laughs> and will end well. It was like a learning process for me because uh, being so involved with the land and realizing that this was part of our makeup of being a, a Hawaiian, that uh, we just didn't know what to do or where to go for help. And then uh, as we started meeting and learning that we did have rights, now more than ever, I, I want to stand up for what we have, and that's the land of Hawaii. So whatever comes ahead, we'll just take it because we've made our first step and claimed what was rightfully ours. So we feel good. That's the reason why we're down here today, to get involved. Even like Kabehi said, ready to go to jail, so am I. Because it's the first time um, 
And we're starting to believe anything to fight back. I think this is the time for all of us to fight back. Getting arrested, that's all right with me. It's fine. I'm ready. First of all, this is the only place where I think most of the people here feel comfortable. And uh, I just love the way it is, that's all. And I, and I, I just love the way, you know, living here. And I love this life and there's nothing else I can say. If we look at that valley in the back here, people used to live there historically. And they've like been pushed off the land. From the valley to this ocean, I mean, to the beach, and now they want to push people into the ocean. You know, I think it's really unfair. No question about it. They're willing to go to jail because uh, the issue is so important that jail is such a minor thing in terms of the position in history that we stand in today. One person in jail is a very small price to pay for the statement we wish to make, that we are Hawaiian citizens, we are not American citizens. This is KHON Channel 2, Honolulu, Hawaii. The Channel 2 News is next. There are new homes at Makua Beach. Despite state eviction notices yesterday, despite the demolition of their dwellings two weeks ago, the squatters are undeterred by the state's efforts to get them out, as Barbara Marshall reports. The ocean in Hawaii is accessible to all. The law says it, the courts decree it, and so the state now and then takes action against what they call squatters. But the people who live at Makua Beach don't consider themselves squatters. So last weekend, they and their supporters came back to Makua, annoyed with the state, which ordered their homes demolished, and with some of their own Hawaiian brothers who, as state employees, helped with the demolition. The people here expect to be arrested. They know the state wants them out, but they know something else. We learn the culture here, as you can see, as far as for fishing, different type of, uh, different ways of fishing anyway. And, uh, If we lose that, how can we survive? Barbara Marshall, Channel 2 News, Makua Beach. Right. <laughs> when our Channel 2 News continues, Hawaii's legislature yeah. for tomorrow's opening day. And why not? Our own people better start looking deep inside of their, their minds and their hearts and come out and feel for the people, for our people. It's been too long and they've been sitting there and thinking about themselves. They have a nice car, they have a nice house, they forget the rest of the people because they're already set. But our culture, our language, and everything was taken away from us. And I'm still confused. Now my mind is opening. The kids are coming now. Coming real bright. They're not going to give up. Just look at our kids now. They're not going to give up because they're following us now. They're looking at us fighting for this car. And all the kids now watching, the Hawaiian kids, they start coming, mind start standing. If we bring them out with us, not just leave them, right? That's how I feel. Because this, the beach is my life. That's why I will never leave this place again. Stand together, it is now and forever. And hold your banners high. We shall stand as a nation to guide the destiny of our generation to sing and praise the glory of our land. That we bring to the hearts and minds of everyone who will see this as a symbol of our love for the Aina, for our love for the history of being Hawaiian, for the love that we have for all people to have the right to have a home, to have a base to raise their children, to the, have the right to food and life and happiness. Give us the power, Okeakua, to show to the world that we love and we are bringing a message 
a message that we have a right to live in harmony with the Aina. We are not anti-American, anti-Christian, or anti-Hawley, but we are pro-Hawaiian. And when I use the term Hawaiian, I'm not talking a racial term. I am talking a political, cultural term. We can substitute, for example, the term Keiki Oka Aina, the people of all races whose first love and loyalty is Hawaii. So we Hawaiians have the right to rule ourselves, a right to our own government, our own nation. We don't want others to force us to live like them. And that's exactly what has happened in Hawaii and is continuing to happen. No place in the history of Hawaii did we give any foreigner the right to force us to speak their language or mimic their lifestyle. Makua today stands for the right of people to control the destiny of ourselves and our children. We expect hostages. We're not afraid. They will come with their badges trying to push us around and arrest us. And we will resist in ways we see fit. Mr. Burgess, will you please move your car? I'll move it if you show me the proper authority. Now, you tell me that Mr. Ono has directed me to move the car. All I'm asking you is where is it written down or can I get in touch with Mr. Ono? Does he even know my car is parked here? Mr. Burgess, will you please move your car? If you don't, you're going to be arrested for obstructing a government operation. Is this a government operation? This is a government operation, and if you don't move it, you're going to be arrested. On, on what grounds? That the car is not supposed Mr. to be Mr. Burgess, there? will you move your car? If you don't, you're going to be arrested for obstructing a government operation. Will you please move your car? My car is parked in an area that is permissible to be parked at. And hey, who's the owner of this car? I am the owner of the car. Actually, the Bank of Hawaii is. Uh, will you please move the car, sir? I can't. Why, why is that? You got your jeeps all over the place. How can I move it? Okay, if we move the jeeps, will you move your car? Under what authority are you asking me to move it? Because uh, we have government operations here and we want you to move the car. We can I see in. your orders for government operations? That's all I want. I, all I want is a paper. Can you show me it? We're asking you, sir, to move the car. I can. You got your jeeps in front of me. Okay, we're going to move the jeeps so you can move, move your jeeps. Car. Take those jeeps out. Take your jeeps out. Move those jeeps out. We've <laughs> 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 got jeeps outside there waiting. I want to hold service before. We can stop. Yeah, We're not stopping anybody coming in right now. We just came in right now to inspect the premises. The United States laws do not apply to Hawaii. So when we talk about legally, we're then reverting back to the basic law of the land. And basically, there is only one law of the land. And that law is Any of these other rules that has been imposed upon Hawaii today, which is not consistent with that basic law, is not proper and should not even be considered. They should be cast out. We hear your power in the rolling waves of the ocean this morning. We feel your power in this circle, the circle of love, the circle that symbolizes the right to live in harmony in Makua. We feel the power that we are to each other. We ask your blessings on our brothers and sisters who will take this action for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Albert Powell. I'm from the Department of Land and Natural Resources. With me are enforcement officers representing the state of Hawaii. Clear this area and remove all the shelters. We're going to ask you to remove yourself and your belongings back beyond the perimeter line, which is the road or the beach. You have three minutes to remove yourself and your belongings from the, these lands.
going to ask you to remove yourself and your belongings back beyond the perimeter, which is either out on the beach or beyond this inner road. We're going to remove these shelters, and if you do not comply, those that are still in the area will be arrested. Compared to the early 70s, the 80s is a, is a waking up period where people getting involved, not just standing on the side and watching. They've been watching since the 70s. In the 80s, they're going to get involved. Where's your arrest? Where's your arrest? would give them dignity that as if they had the right to arrest us it's stupid everybody knows that mike does not make right it doesn't solve anything it just shows who got the weapons who got the dogs who's got the loaders and who's got the arms that was started way back when Lili Okalani herself was arrested and tried for trying to change the form of government that had come into Hawaii and taken away the rights of the Hawaiian people to determine their own destiny. And Lili Okalani was not the only one. You had Jonah Kuhio Kalaneanaole who had to go to trial. Today we have the modern warriors and their names are Naiole, Mahiai, Alana, Niao, Kihana, and Kilihileua. So these are the modern warriors and yet fighting for the same basic principle that has never left Hawaii, the right of people to determine what kind of future their children will be in, what kind of use of land will be used for Makua Beach and for other Hawaiian areas. Some very basic rights are being talked about in this action that's happening at Makua.
is something special. Papa saw the hoku shining bright. In Makua, you can feel that energy coming from the ground. Once we're here, we never feel like leaving. We get good spirits this place. Real good. Return to Honolulu City Light. A lot of the spirits are still walking the land. So we stay. Whether I'm or not, welcome and see. I mean, it takes away your pain. If you live at Makua, you know about sharing. Mountains, the valley, and the ocean. Makua is alive. It's a natural breathing thing. Where we want to be. White sands and the water say good morning. Oh yeah, the dolphins come here every day. As we watch the night, I swim so playfully. They put on a show for you, you know, it's like, wow. <laughs> They've come with the whales to greet us at the dawning. You don't have to go to see like park. <laughs> of another sunny day for you and me. You have to enjoy the life, to love the life, to live the life at Makula. It's a terrible place if you look at it sometimes. Winds, rain, waves, knocking down your camps in Holly. But then, sometimes just like nature itself, oh God, you start to appreciate those winds, those terrible waves, that blistering sun. It's a wall. We lay on it at the setting of the sun. Fish fish is the winner. To find it full of ea when the morning comes. Protein, right? Ooh. With the uwa koko over us in Makua. For this whole island now mahalo e keakua. Makua is calling. I always tell people, you know, whoever you are, Makua is calling. I told people that you can see the caves start to opening up, holes, and you know, a lot of wines coming, they can see it. You know, we see, uh, you know, from Evies, uh, we see from, uh, from ancient times of the, the mobile stones and, and things of that nature. We have never seen that before publicly. Maybe it has been addressed before, but what I'm saying, all of these signs are saying that protect Makua. Magic is Makua, our Aina. Makua is a parent, it's like it takes care of you. And that belongs to you and me. Living in Makua, it's part of our right. It's the Puhonua for the Kua Aina. Because this is a sanctuary. A place where we Hawaiians can still be free. Many come to heal. So we stay. Can't beat it. On another sunny day for you and me. The days where we Hawaiians can still be free. Actually, people taking care of people. That's what the Hawaiians are all about. Makua, I love this place. And they should give back us this place. Makua Manua, the refuge for the Hawaiians. So basically, you know, when people talk about Malkua, you know, uh, they think we're a bunch of winos or something like that. We're talking families. The Manos were passing here in this area. It's a family of six. This is another family. They have a family of 16. But, you know, the, the bulk of the majority of the families average here about six years. This is Kaimana. Kaimana family, uh, they have a family of five. This is the Kane family. They run about 22 people here. Uh, this is Gabby. Um, this is uh, another brother here, and he's about 69, 71 years old. We even have uh, all the Polynesian brothers, from the Samoans to the Tongans. 
the city transit stops right directly in front of this area just on the bridge and all the kids naturally walk down this dirt road and jump on the buses to go to school. So we're looking at a very busy community. It's alive and well. A lot of people say about Aina, these people live in it. Like many other Hawaiians living all over the islands, experiencing the land itself, the winds, the ocean, the mountains, the birds. I'm just one of them that just walking around in the same land and saying we're caretakers of the land. I'm a free spirit like my first ancestors before me. So if I look a little wicked, a little kind of crazy, or a little bushman, but that's what it's all about, living in naturally in the Aina. Look at Makua, and as we go along, please do not judge us and say, poor little Hawaiians living on the beach. We are the richest nation in the world. As you can see, I have the richest food bank in the land, it's just by looking at this beautiful ocean. And the most of all, the most important thing of all, the quality of life is spirituality. These people are here today can always tell the same story. A huge machine, a fast modern machine was moving on them, and no one was there to reach them. First of all, we moved out of our house about three years ago, because from 400, they raised the rent to 1,000. You know, we went to stay at different places, different parts, but everywhere they kept kicking us off. So we moved here, and it's been real good here. We just have to fight the wind and the rain <laughs> all the time. And when we first moved here, for the first few months, every time we'd come home, want to cry because our, our tent was down and all our things were all wet. I mean, washing clothes by hand is real hard, <laughs> you know. And every time you wash and then it rains and then it's wet again and oh my God. But then, you know, I, I, I think what don't kill you makes you stronger. In the summertime, it's real good. You know when we, someone catches fish, we all share. But the best fish for eat is what? Papillo, yeah? That papillo tastes good. <laughs> yeah, Jack? He like taco. That's his favorite. Yeah, yeah this is my dentist, the man is so <laughs> color him. That's why grandma has him. Because no one can handle him. But he's a good diver. Yeah, he's real good. He belongs to the water. So he needs the water. He's happy. He's had a hard life, you know, being from a single and everything. He don't like no rubbish in the ocean. And he don't like those plastic that they have on the juice and the soda. He cuts it all out. Because he knows it's dangerous for the dolphins and the seals. You know, it's unreal when we talk about evictions, you know, it seems like every uh, island is facing eviction somehow. And so when we're talking, you know, about eviction, uh, all the people were scared here. They didn't know what to do. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to live? They had no idea. So said, man, so we just stay here and naturally learn about ourselves and the Aina. Some of the history in Kanyana Cave at the end of the valley is where the legend says that when Maui first came to the islands, that's where he learned how to use fire. Kaina Point on the other end is part of... Uh, the origination chant, Kumulipo. This seems to have been a lua sanctuary where the warriors were trained. Not much taro was grown in this area, but sweet potato. And we've been growing sweet potato here, and it, it's amazing how well it grows and how quickly. Now, the story is that the fishermen out at sea would be able to smell the maile that grew back here, the maile li'ili'i. Li. The entire back section where the uh, range is right now, there's a large fish pond there. And it's amazing that this valley was able to, to provide so much. I read history on it, and they said that uh, the missionaries was writing things when they come from Wailua. They're talking about the sweet waters. They're talking about sweet shrimp, the peely grass, the wild taro. And probably the rarest thing of all is the, the Hawaiian snail. The Hawaiian snail basically lives on uh, one type of tree and all its life just stays there. And the snail is unique. So this valley had aquaculture and it had agriculture. What happened uh, after that? Speculations, you know, uh, assumptions. 
Uh, the more we start to get educated, the more we start to realize the damage and actually to our culture is very important. We have a self-government, self-sufficient here at Makua. Makua today still can be the same. This is Manaura. This is from the south, that's from the Cook Islands. And the color behind there is um, Moe. It's, it's one of the best that we have for pounding poi. Pumpkin. Pumpkin was used at on time for fishing and whatnot. Tell me what I'm doing wrong for hunting. You know, if, if you can improve them from what it was, uh, yeah. That's a day thing and a survival today. This battle is the kitchen. Uh, let's go on. Okay. Is that a fat oil? Hey. Hallelujah, like butter, what it gets? Hallelujah. It's a hallelujah now. Yeah, hallelujah. Everything I get is all planted by hand. Water one time a week. Oh, hello. All the pumpkins are growing now. I think another three more weeks, they start fruiting. We'll get our food up. Uh, here's the squash. So this is it. I mean, you can plant anything, anything you want. Main thing, you got to get water. That's the main thing. You have to have water. This is it, stream beans, Filipino stream beans. And now what I water in here is one and only. That's a watermelon. But when I first came, six months ago, this was it, right here. Oh, kelvy, koi, wild grasses, glasses, tolly, bulls, whatever. People come in, in here, just throw it. They'll respect the area. They just throw everything inside. But you clean beer, all right? Enough to plant. To have something to eat. Uh, they come and say you gotta be evicted. Why? You gotta tell us why. We don't do nothing wrong. We don't bother nobody. We have everybody come here every day. And everybody enjoy this stuff. My people think we block access and we don't. We've had tourists from Canada and Japan and all the rest of the United States. I mean, summertime, it's non-stop. We don't stop them from using the beaches. They're welcome to come anytime. If, if anything, I give them all extra things, they're fine, man. <laughs> We're going to brag about your, your plants. Uh, Sia is one of our uh, members of the council. In fact, she just amazed me. You know, a lot of people talking about planting. She was planting. She housed the water with her station wagon. You know, you, you can imagine all this beautiful uh, agriculture work is done by her and her family. What is the, that's the same thing, the sweet potato. Sweet potato and pumpkin, green onion, and pele. <laughs> and Alex, you want a melon. You, you think you want a melon ready? No, it's still yet over there. This is squash. Pretty soon ready. Tapioca. Mm, tapioca. So how long it took you to plant all this? It's only three months to plant this. Now she's one of the richest families here in uh, Makua. <laughs> and she always says, you know, the people should help each other over here. Everybody should stick together. That's what she tells me. I plant for? this, I gotta have my people to Makua to feed them for, for area eh? huh? and clean up the mess around here. She even go outside and tell people, stop uh, dumping your, your trash here at Makua. This is the, the pile of rubbish from a <laughs> roofing company. So I clean them up all myself. I was that damn eight. Hey, this is not for them. I used to dive here 30 years ago. And back then, the beer bottles were 10, 15 feet tall. Piles of them, dumped. Bodies were dumped here, dogs and trash. It was a pig pen. But since the people are living here, they're more stewards of the land than I've ever seen in a long, long time. And it's not costing anybody anything. We've kept it cleaner than it's ever been. People that come out from the outside, well, they leave their opala and we try to clean it up, you know. This is all junk. Millions of bottle beers and sodas and stuff like that. And uh, many other things was in this river. So this family here, I don't know what drove them, but they decided to clean it up. So we saved the, the state right now, you know, about $165,000 worth of uh, labor. And how I got that figure was just simple. Just reading the newspapers, when they, they're talking about cleaning out, uh, you know, rivers and stuff like that, it runs about three, 400000 So I'm going cheap, 165. 
We don't have health problems. We have mobile toilets. And these are private companies come down here, they pump out the toilet uh, once a week. So as far as health is concerned, uh, we have naturally uh, conquered that situation. We're looking at a beach park. The only time the state claims uh, they own it as a beach park when us Hawaiians start to settle back into the land of the Aina. Besides that, uh, the state ignored this park. It must be the spirituality of Makua. I think it's a spirituality of the strength of God itself saying, lay off this godly land. Like stars in the sky. Makua is a healing place and it's not necessarily going there just for a day or a moment it's a place that you can go put a bed set your stove up and live for a while and feel the Amakua me a message from within. people that come here they have all these problems but they don't know why it starts working out and a lot of them used to be drug addicts and so they don't have to be anymore because they can get high off of this place the ocean the mountain I mean Look at this place, it's beautiful. No matter how violent or angry they might be out living in a concrete jungle, when they come out here, there's a more relaxed feeling. And at that point, now the true person starts coming out. They're just like this pond here. Uh, I call this a therapy pond. The wife said, I want to kill my husband, go sit in the pond. So I, I try to tell the ladies, this is a perfect pond for PMS. You know, and when the, when the rocks start to roll with you on the, on the sand, right in that little wave, it gives you a nice massage at the same time. So it's a nice uh, therapy. And then, of course, the background is the ocean and, and the skies. And it gives you all that inner uh, therapy. And the kids love it here. Because it's so Grabbing her boogie board. <laughs> she's swimming early in the morning. She's not even two years old. <laughs> And he's only six, seven months. He loves it. He's happy. The kids are healthy. Without these kids, I see on a cold slime, man. <laughs> he's used to the cold showers at Kiawas. Feeling so much love and energy. I'm disabled. And I get arthritis in my knee. I go all over in the water just for enjoyment, a little bit of therapy check on his uh, medical records. He's a walking dead man, they say. That's exercise right there. Diabetes, heart problems, blood clots. Bring the wine to the ocean, and there it is. He'll get healed. Sing to me a love song, rhapsody. You want to sit in a room for 24 hours a day and call that quality of life? Or you want to do this and call this quality of life? So who's doing the therapy? Well, I call it Makua. Mahalo. This is the home of my Hale. The Hale is simply built. It's built on old canvases from uh, military. I get the majority of my materials from uh, other man's trashes and bring it on here so now she becomes a treasure. Basically, all these homes where, you know, you're looking at right now is for uh, retreats. You know, people that in, in drugs naturally have stress or abuse. So I decided to build things. So total price of this holiday is just under $40. And I, I like to show people and actually teach them about basic survival. And my method always going to be is you can be poor, but you don't have to live poorly. This is not called my drug center. The tent can last for about five to ten years. It can take up to uh, about 85 mile an hour winds, and it's perfect for a family of uh, four. In Vietnam, we call it a uh, command post tent. I call this my $10 wonder. We had about several, uh, what do we call, uh, uh, all-purpose tent. That's about 40 feet in length and uh, 18 feet in width. So we had a bunch of families living uh, in those tents, price under $40. Nothing fantastic, just simple. You know, we're, we're one paycheck away from being homeless anywhere in the state. Where do we go if we make a mistake? It ends up getting people to the point of no return. Emotionally, mentally, they have no, no hope. So you end up having a standoff in Sand Island and getting shot.
unless something is set up like this for us to go to the city of refuge type thing whether as a nation or part of the sovereignty what they're doing now is that they're practicing sovereignty they're not waiting for it to happen they're doing it our feelings of love and connectedness to the land are beginning to rise and we need a place to go and we got to start here and makua is crying for us to come home and it was a garbage dub i i, I just i was really torn between running away and staying but i had no place else to go so i built and as i started to build mine i started to realize that everyone here had basically a common reason for coming down here. Life had shattered in one way or another. And I had no idea this land, this water, I hated water. I was scared of water. But I find myself right next door to it. And it's awesome. <laughs> Something about the soil or the sand here or the salt air makes fruit sweeter and beans sweeter. I mean, everything is sweet. And we're healing our past of torment and destruction. And many of us are beginning to rake the land, rake the land, not rape the land, and we're beginning to uncover things that was here before. And within that, we're finding our connection. It was just fascinating. Find something like this and being just, to me, like right there. You know, get uh, to be big people seven feet plus. I'll say five people here. In just this spot right here. There's a couple more underneath there. A couple more over there. I mean, the family's pretty much spread out. From my understanding, they're all buried in the same manner, wrapped in top of, put inside a uh, lot of baskets. This one right here, that's the main one. That's the Kukuna himself. Uh, Maybe he's trying to help us in the situation that we are in right now. Maybe he wants to fight for us and wants to get back to the land. So I look at it. And, you know, you could explain it or naturally dissect it later on, but it comes on to us as we are protecting these bones. Uh, maybe that's why it's opening up. McCoy is telling everyone, you know, lay off the Hawaiians here because it's naturally, it's her children. Lay off the Hawaiians any place here in the Hawaiian Islands, wherever they go, because it's her children. I do a lot of mechanic work and stuff like that. Uh, right now, getting out there, getting jobs. How do you feel about these guys? Uh... Trying to move us off? Yeah. <laughs> I feel kind of bad. <laughs> I don't want to move. I hope they don't come move us. I know what they're going to do with the rest of the people and the welfare get cut. Because most of them are going to end up down here with us. The state today is broke. The state and the federal government, and that's all private agencies now, are broke. They do not have the facilities to help them, and actually the Hawaiians. Somebody no more one can tomato sauce, we get them, we cover them. Whatever, we all share. Yeah, whatever it takes. It's better to live down a beach, more safe. I feel safer here than I would feel in Wainai Town, Waipahu Town. I feel safer here. Everybody watch their camp from, everybody watch each other's camp from, you know? Hey, down here we get our own neighborhood watch. We don't get theft. Yeah. We get no crime over here. No. They stop in vehicles for damaging naturally the, the beaches, the four-wheel drives and stuff like that. They're stopping uh, uh, crime, you know, and they're stopping people uh, breaking into vehicles, uh, people getting assaulted like that. If you don't believe me, call up the Hawaiian, uh, what you call the Waianae Police Department. They'll tell you all the facts and figures on that. More Hawaiians living here, less crime. We're not homeless. We're Hawaiians. Before the word homeless, they called us squatters. But let's go further back. Before that, it was a Hawaiian lifestyle. We were homeless then, or did we say, welcome to our land? I go fishing. O iu, akule, moe. Papio and then Ulua. Oh, I catch Opelo too here. Need the natural food. Eh? Fresh fish in the morning. Oh. I said, come away, Nene. I get them. Let's go. Fresh fish is the winner. Oh, here, Limo Pepe. Manuel. 
Limo LL. Limo Coho, it is. It's, it's like a Geritas. Fine, eh? So I love this. The thing gives plenty. Real plenty. I just learned recently what Pikai and Kapukai meant. You know, the healing, the blessing of yourself and your surroundings. And you see the kids that are in the water surfing, I mean, what they're doing, they're blessing themselves. They don't even know they're doing it, it's just that it feels good. But to the outside society, feeling good is not as important as getting the job done. And the gauge of success is how much money did you make? It is our culture. It is our culture we're talking about that's trying to be destroyed. They want to respect everyone else's culture. But when it comes to the Hawaiian, we're odd, we're different. So Makua brings us and reminds us about, you're not odd, you're Hawaiian. You're not unorthodox, this is your culture. This village here is gonna fight for that culture. They don't know it, I don't know it. We just know it's gonna happen. The range now has one captain that's in charge of environment, but uh, the Army's coming around, they've, uh, they've got a lot of programs. Number one, you can see the fire break roads that we're putting in here to cut down the fire. No mortar rounds can go within 150 meters of the fire break road. Also for trees, they're trying to get indigenous trees back in here. They put fence up there in certain areas around the plant so the goats don't get into the endangered plants. The Army lawyers are looking it over. They, they like to move cattle in here. Uh, when it all comes down to it, it, it might say the, the Army is caretakers for this land. And if the Army, a lot of people say, well, get the military out of here, but you've got to think, too, if the Army is not in here, then who would be in here? And if you check those leases out and the, the people... <laughs> you looking at them? No, I don't think. I think McCandless would have. You see the target? Those black giant squares on the mountain. Up on the mountain. It's down though. Yeah, that's the targets. And the helicopters fly low the and the machine be guns. Coming in. Sound like <laughs> it really sound like TV. Like you're watching a war movie on TV. Only in real life. The full blast the volume. <laughs> full blast volume. They wake up from their sleep because at night they even um, practice. For the rest of the night I got a little OP stuck to me all night long. <laughs> when I lay on the ground and the bombs are dropped at night, it shatters for miles, and it's just, as it shatters her body, it shatters my body. Yeah, and there's questions to be asked. Maku was burnt, would burn many times. Maku was blown up many times. And I think it's time to say, stop. Maku says, somebody please help. I am getting wounded. I'm getting ripped apart. I'm getting ignored. They're gonna be bombing and bombing and bombing. And it's sad. They're saying they're being conservative, but they're going to blow it up again. It don't make sense. You're killing the soul of Makua. It's an open front ocean, you know, given that with the beautiful white beaches. It's just like any tour book you look at. But this is different. It's an open front that is very few on this island of Oahu. Yeah, the beaches are great, but we want it all. We want it from naturally from the valley down to the beach itself. And there's no other land base, you know, on the island of Oahu that can actually give the Hawaiians their culture back than Makua. residing on the property without prior written consent of the Board of Land and Natural Resources is deemed to be unauthorized occupants. The LNR says, well, my job is to get everybody out on an eviction, and where you go is not our problem. <laughs> Nothing so awful in Hawaii as evictions because these are not the evictions of ordinary people. These are evictions of the Kanaka Maoli, the first people of this place. May I explain this? My name is Mason Young with the State Department of Land and Natural Resources. They're like pushing us off the face of the earth. This is as far as at the end of this 
Hey, Linda, you can go now. Where are we going? In the water. Mm. Where are they going to kick us to? Another beach park? Cause we no more five cents, we no more house. No more a a la pa for the amore. Some of those we yeah, talked with yeah, say yeah, they'll okay. comply with this notice to vacate by April 15th. Others tell us they'll stay and fight. I want to know the past and where I am and where I'm going. I want to use a malo echo for my going. And sleep in a hale or a la. Intimidating. Very intimidating, but it was a very intimidating act. When a man is down, no one should actually try to knock him out. How about you, contemporary please? Hear your children crying out loud. No more I no it to go home to. All we get is pilikia. Are you here? are getting so close that you think it's a sad movie and everybody heard it before. I'm telling people I'm a soldier. It's enough is enough. It is time to make a stand. It's 103 years has went by. Enough is enough. Nike. It's a popular surf spot called Pine Trees. We've heard that uh, from the roadside on the highway, some surfers or some people look down at the trees down here and they said, oh, that look like pine trees. So that name stuck, Pine Trees. And then when you come all the way in, it's not pine trees at all, it's mangrove. What's so great about this land is uh, this area here, Kohanaiki. It's not only a surf spot, it's not only a, a place to hang out. This place is so rich with mana. The people that come here, they come here to find tranquility, come here to be, get in touch with the land, get in touch with the spirits. This is where it's at. People can just come here and, and use the beach, you know, to just go surfing or be with their family. And um, this is a really good community building place. You know, this is this is the heart. 
And the thing I like the most about coming down the road is to see the, the local people throwing net, fishing, teaching their children about the tide pools, mixing with the Howleys. The whole community uses this area. It's a, it's a public beach. When you compare the Big Island to uh, the other islands, we have uh, very few beaches, especially when you compare the size of our island. So that makes the beaches we do have very special. And uh, especially pine trees because of its undeveloped beauty. You know, this point right over here, Hawaii Wall, suggests to me that this is where all the canoes that pile up because probably because of the Kona wind. Well, this area, this whole area, Konaiki, is so important to Ohana because because of so the overabundance of fish over here, all the cores feeding this place over here, the Oa Popaula underground feeding the cores outside here, feeding the Opelo, feeding the Aku, feeding the Mahimai, Ono, the Ao. You know, and the Hawaiians before, they don't have to go that far out. Everything right out there, so easy. So easy for the Hawaiians, no need to make hard. And that's why this place is so special, because there is a variety of things that we do here. People camp, people gather, people just walk around this area just to find peace. And in turn, what, what we get back is peace, and what we get back is identity. This is one of the major ponds of the Ankaline complex. Over the years, it has been taken over by the mangrove. And uh, as you can see, the mangrove is overgrown over the pond and it is killing the pond. And uh, there's not much light coming in here and uh, it's kind of dark and desolate. And in the ponds, there is some opai ula still. But this site here was once a site of a holly. And over at this holly is where an old woman used to take care of children whose parents were sent over to Kalaupapa um, because they were suffering from Hansen's disease, from leprosy. So there's a story that says uh, the root word for the title Kohaneke is the word Hanai, in that uh, she would be the one to Hanai the children of parents who were sent to Kalaupapa on Molokai. But this was the site where she bathed the children and fed the children and cared for the children while the parents were away. We're at the southwestern corner of Kohaneke. We're right alongside one of the most important uh, ankyline complexes in West Hawaii. There are 80 ponds in this area, and because of the diversity, the nutrient levels here, we have some six species of opai here, there are other invertebrates, there's some snails that's on a unique and rare list. What's also here is our last breeding pair of the Io, the endangered Hawaiian stilt. There is danger from predators, uh, mainly mongoose and wildcats, but the biggest danger is development. And uh, if uh, the ankyline ponds are disturbed in any way by development and silt runoff from golf courses or any disturbances. It will harm the ecosystem here. And in time, the birds will perish. This is a central site of the ankyline complex. We are surrounded by six ponds that are all connected. And this is the Kaula stone, the guardian stone of the pond. This is where our people did their rituals to ensure good harvest and good fishing. We're at the farthest southern pond of this ankyline complex. 
the wall dividing the middle of this pond and the makaha, the gateway on the other end, was used to channel water and to control the flow of water. This wall was also used to divide the different age groups for the types of fishes that we raised here, which were ava and mullet, and of course the opai ula, which was our main bait for opello. These ones, you look how rich the color, all the, the ula ula, that, that fire, that redness, is so vivid, bright, you know, for many generations, our, our family have been utilizing this uh, Opai Ula for pillow fishing. And uh, this kind of stuff is handed down from the kupunas. You know, when I was a small kid, you know, my tutu told me that where you find the Opai Ula coming out outside in the deep ocean water, you malama that place, take care. Because if you take care of that, that, that decor, you never, you never stuff. Every time we go, fishing for opelo, and we, we, and we catch opelo, and we use opai sometimes. We find the opai inside the stomach of this uh, opelo. And when we go fishing for ahi, we find the opelo inside the ahi, and they get opai. We go catch uh, ahu. We open the stomach, and they get the ahu, they get the opelo, they get the opai. So, so like Tutu Man was saying, you take care of this kind of stuff. All these, all these ponds all live together. They're all one family, all one ohana. Anybody come over here disturbed, or even a huge development like that, they would surely affect these ponds. And that could affect our fishing, our subsistence. This kind of stuff, we can play around with too much because you know, a lot of people do not understand the purpose and function of this kind of stuff. And only simple. This kind of stuff, you know, Nico's school. The school is right over here. You know, nowadays, no more too much open official. But fortunately for me and my Juana, you know, we've been encouraged to keep on this kind of, you know, traditional uses. So, you know, open official, it won't take you too long to fix open. We're going to go there, but hour and a half hope, sometimes a one hour work for Opelo. So you get enough Opelo. The bait that we use for the charm, the Opelo is Opai. But you have to have the Opai because the why? because it's live bait. Eh? You know, anytime you get live, live, uh, live meat or whatever, live stuff, you need to feed them. Or you, I mean, actually, the action is, you know, you get all the action because Opelo will play it, they will like to eat. Not anybody can hope because you got to get a lot of patience. It takes time. It takes time for the Apollo and it takes time a lot of fishing out there because when you're out there, the Opelo can be around on a boat and you gotta wait for the right current. It's without fishing, you cannot survive Opelo fish. But living in an environment, in a natural environment, like, like, like how I live, it made me a much better Hawaiian. Things you learn in school is fine. But when you, you learn in an environment, a natural environment, all the cultural, traditional things, it's the application, you know? Because you're actually doing it. You know, you know stay in the class, study book, read paper, write notes, they do this, do that. No, but you're doing it. Because you're living off the land, you're living off the fish, you're actually doing, doing it, take part. You know, everything could be a lot of talk, but what, what good is it if you don't do it? One thing with Honoka on here, as you look at this place, they ban it, fish, man, load it. What just happened, if I catch them, I go give them. So the more I, the more I give, the more good luck I get. The more you give, the more you get. That's what I do, I give. As far as I can remember, we've been coming to this area gathering seafood, variety of fishes, uh, the uhu, opopalu, and all kind in the back, as far as the ponds and the shrimp, vana, which is the uh, sea urchin, hauki uki, which is the helmet urchin, black crab, opihi, I mean, and variety of limus, uh, 
the limu waiwaiole, which is what they call the rat's foot, uh, limu kohu, the limu pahe'e, which is the slippery limu. And there was one special one that uh, we learned a lot about. The limu kala is what it's called. It was used to catch the fish, also given the same name, kala. Uh, it was also used as a first aid. They would chew on that limu if you had like a deep cut. If you fell, you had a deep cut. They'd put that limu on the sore. It would help stop the bleeding and kind of heal it a little bit quicker. And to use as a peace pipe effect, where they used it for forgiveness, for healing in the family. Um, coming to this area was, was heritage. It was being taught the things that you should know and pass on. Whereas families would come together, not just to gather um, your food sources, but to learn that you can use the ocean and the ponds for refrigeration for any kind of perishable food items you had so that your fish wouldn't spoil. Your drinks could get cold if you had to bring water in a bottle or something like that. Um, use the pond areas for, for bathing. Just many, many things could be taught just by coming here, coming to this area, all through the west coast, all through the islands, in fact. Beach, the ocean, the land, it was like a, a source of life. It was a giving. I believe that to be a strong heritage, a strong teaching, a strong foundation. Because without that, I believe we would be a lost people. Somebody that has no past has no future. And we, if we don't have anything that we can pass on to our family, to our children, our children's children, and they onto their children, then we are lost. I believe that to be a final blow. I would call it a death. I would call development a death. <laughs> Resort development at Kohanaiki has been controversial since its inception in 1986. In 1986, the Kona Beach Development Venture bought this property and initiated the rezoning process. They prepared an EIS and the county council reviewed it. Eventually, even though much of the public and the community came out and voiced their concerns, there was people filling the, filling the auditorium. They couldn't keep all the people inside. There were so many people that were against the idea of a resort at their favorite spot, Pine Trees or Kohanaiki. Uh, just about the whole community on the west side of Hawaii and Kona um, used this area. And the resort development just, just, just does not fit in with what the community is about here. Eventually, though, the property was rezoned. And needless to say, it became so much more valuable that within three weeks, that development company sold it. They sold it to Nansei Hawaii, who now owns the property, and it's a Japanese-based investment company. The uh, resort people don't seem to respond to what we're saying about its uniqueness and how important it is to us. When the county council approved the rezoning, they were looking at a, at a proposed resort that was four to 600 feet from the ocean. The main building was a 400-room hotel. When Nancy got their shoreline management area permit, the resort had grown. It's now an 800-room convention hotel. It has wings that come as close to 150 feet from the coastline. It's grown to be a 75-foot tall building with six stories. Obviously, a hotel with double the number of rooms will put out double the amount of wastewater and other solid waste. If the resort goes through as planned, it would uh, completely dominate this area and very possibly uh, pollute the water, you know, from runoff from uh, the golf courses, which is believed to cause ciguatera poisoning in our fish here. Development companies are uh, in the business to make money and to attract tourists to their resorts. They have little compassion or feeling for the local people. And when a resort goes in here on the west side, we've seen it time and time again out north, 
where there's a security guard shack at the entrance of the resort. Uh, they tell you that there's no parking available for you. Uh, basically, they turn you around and send you on your way rather than let you go to the beach that you've been going to for years. They want this beach to be used for just their hotel guests and you know that's it's not fair to us because this is one of the only places we have and I want my kids to see you know what I had you know I want to be able to say I went to this beach you know this is this is where I learned to surf this is where I went you know with my friends and stuff this is where we hung out I don't want to say that we went to oh this hotel and we snuck into this pool you know like like you know, some people do it. That's just not for me. That's not something I want for my friends, for my, for my children, for my friends' children, for Hawaii. The developers would like to make us believe that this will help us, that, you know, they'll give us parking, they'll give us stalls, and, you know, they'll make this place better. But I, I really don't think that covering this place over with a lot of cement is gonna make anything better. You know, it'll make more people come over here, make jobs that we don't need, make the cost of living go up. As far as Hawaii goes, we have a very, very low percent of unemployment, or unemployment rate. And we have more hotel and resort jobs that can be filled right now. And I think if you look at the, the state of our tourism right now, it's really low. The hotels we do have are running at very, very low occupancies. Is this what we really want? Do we want to spoil a, a beautiful spot like this for those reasons? In times of um, a recession, when people are being laid off, when the tourist industry, when the hotels are empty, the first people that to get laid off are menial labor. And basically the job positions that would be opening up to the local people are those of menial jobs where they would stand the chance of losing their jobs in hard times. So it's, I don't think it's fair to claim that this would create more jobs. Um, I think the main question we need to ask is, is another hotel development what Hawaii really needs? This past recession during the war has shown us all that um, the area of tourism cannot support Hawaii economically. We need to diversify. We can't go on depending on tourism as a way to support our people. There can be other things done with the island besides abusing the beauty it has here. We have problems to the south here. Koloko Honokahala National Park is to the south. Um, and the encroachment on that park is a, a major problem. The Koloko Honokahala National Park was set aside specifically because of its importance to the Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian history. This area here, Kohonaiki, is just an extension of the Koloko Honokahau Park. The park people have talked extensively about uh, not developing this land because this land is a continuation of that area. The SMA permit was issued and allowing on that plan are 250 low-level bungalow-type resort units of which some of them sit right inside the congressionally designated park boundary. Uh, the destruction of the sites would be we can never recover from that. They're, they're one of a kind and they're very important to the culture of the Hawaiian people. We're at the southern boundary of Kohaneki, right alongside Koloko Honokohau National Park. We're in front of one of the biggest complexes here. What makes this place important for us is not only that it was a habitation complex at one time, but that it was a massive site. And this tells us the real importance lies in the amount of people who lived, worked, and died here. Just to the south of us is where the political and religious power laid. This is one of the main reasons that we're working to preserve this site. This is one of our fishing heiaus, and it overlooks Vavahiva'a Point. Out here is where the Opelo and Ahikoas are. 
what the developer wants to do is use this in his scheme and his resort plans. And to us, this is arrogant and this is desecration. What we're saying is we restore and maintain this heiau for its rightful purpose and for its rightful people to use. We feel if they deny us this right, what they do is they cut us off from our traditional past. This is an ancient well site. Western documentation says that our people lived here from the 1400s. Actually, we feel that our people lived here for centuries before that. We're in the middle of hundreds of cultural sites, archeological sites, and all of these things, again, tell us the importance of this place. All this before me is my history. I'm surrounded by my own history. The structure down there and the structure further down on this side, from that corner. You, get, if you stay in the ocean out there and you get out of those markers. Out and beyond that, you stay out of the core. You stay within the core, you pick up, you go pick up fish. Foreigners come over here, they go think it's just a bunch of rocks. But they don't know. That's the Hawaiian, they know. You know, it's, uh, people come over here, develop this area. They change the whole landscape, they change the whole scene of this place. For us fishermen, this is our marker. Build up marker, they take away our marker. The mar markers up there. Turn towards Kailua, corner side, they build up that side, no more a marker. You cannot find your spot. Take away from this from the Hawaiians, to like taking part of your Hawaiianness away from you. Coming from a fishing family, a fishing background. This is part of one of the reasons that I exist. This is who I am. I hope they don't take this away from me. Approximately 108 archaeological sites on this property. The blue and orange dots show some of them. However, the developer plans to destroy all but approximately 15 of those sites, which are represented by the orange dots. 15 significant sites that they chose fits in their resort plan. But to us Hawaiians, all the archaeological sites is significant because it was left, to, left by our kupunas as treasures for us as Hawaiians to see how they live. And in turn, we could, in the future, possibly live that way too and live in uh, harmony with nature, live in harmony with all the surroundings around here. Development has destroyed a lot of our past, a lot of our heiaus, a lot of our Dittagapar burial sites and desecrated all of our land, all of our past. So Hawaiians now, we have a hard time retracking our past because a lot of it is gone. This Japanese developers here, they want to take all of that away. And we as Hawaiians are cultural and they, Japanese people, are supposed to be cultural too. If I was to go to their ancestral lands and desecrate their burial sites, take one of their shrines, I would be locked up. They would, you know, they would, that's a crime. But here, they can come here and do it to us. Last year, we started coming over here. This was one of the first sites that I found. This place gave me a special feeling. This place is what started our organization off. This place began to point the way, guide us, and give us a spirit to form this organization in order to combat and battle 
the things that destroy. This is an archaeologist tag. As you can see, what was once a very important site is now rubble. We call it Kapulu, to us, messy. But this here is more than messy. In the Western terms, this is full-on desecration. Everything just dug up, strewn all over the place, and left there. This is done with complete disregard to our culture, complete disregard and disrespect to our people. We have a lot of historical sites back here. You know, we have um, bones, we have uh, places where Hawaiians used to live, and a hotel will disturb it. It'll bring a lot of foreigners in that, you know, don't quite know about, you know, the uses of this place. And um, I think that uh, them going around the ponds and checking out the burial sites and stuff, you know, because a hotel will be the, around there and they may have a, a little fenced area, a little sign saying what it once was. And they'll, they'll want to poke around and look at it, but, you know, that's, that's not what it's for. And we need the few areas left that we have. You know, no more for tourists. You know, not being greedy, but, you know, they have their little sanctuaries. We need ours. to be a large amount of native plants here. They get a lot of their mana from the ocean, from the water, the breeze, from the, the salt in, in the air. When I go out together, I'm very respectful. I am careful where I step because I've been taught everything has life, even the rocks have life. Um, that's the way we were brought up. Every family had their own kahuna la'o lapa'au. Just one member of the family was in charge of preparation and administering the la'o lapa'au. This is the ilima, a variety, one variety of ilima. There's five, I understand. And the pua, the, the flowers were gathered for the babies, for their stomach to clean out their opu. This is the uha loa, or ala ala pu loa, it was called by the Hawaiians. And that was for congestion, um, also for cough, to extract the phlegm. Um, if it was not pounded and made into a tea, the bark would be chewed on. So they would chew on the bark, it's very bitter. Very bitter to the taste, and it's hard to take. But the Hawaiians have a saying, the bitter, the better, and that's the bitter roots from the Uhaloa. And the naupaka was used for, as a tenderizer. Um, the he'e, um, when they didn't have time to pound, pound, pound the he'e to soften it, they would use the naupaka, and that was used as a tenderizer. And this is, Right here, the pohui hui is the beach morning glory, and the young shoots from this pohui hui was used for bee stings or insect bites, centipedes, scorpion, and this type of hina hina was used for tea as a blood purifier or cleanser, and it's grows in abundance here. I've never seen so many of the different types of hina hina as I've seen.